If you win, the table will honor its word. You will have your freedom. But you won't take it. I want you to find your peace. But a good death only comes after a good life. An execution. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained. As heavily requested, today we're going to be exploring John Wick 4, the recently released installment in the John Wick series. Directed by Chad Stahelski, who helmed the previous three films, and starring the legendary Keanu Reeves, the late Lance Reddick, Ian McShane, Donnie Yen, Lawrence Fishburne, Hiroyuki Sanada, Shamir Anderson, Rina Sawayama, Scott Adkins, and Bill Skarsgård, the newest chapter is the bombastic icing on the proverbial cake that is the John Wick series. The latest entry into the franchise is the encapsulation of what happens when an unstoppable force, in this case Wick, meets an immovable object, the High Table, an Illuminati-like shadow organization with seemingly unlimited power and influence. You come here thinking there is a way out of this world for you, Mr. Wick. There is not. The Centre Pompidou. Ambitious and bigger in every way, the fourth film offers a larger scope, consolidating on all the world-building, action, and character work that has come to represent the series. Coming in with a runtime of 2 hours and 49 minutes, it's the longest entry in the series, the most epic, probably the most ingenious for its use of cinematography, and the one that pushes John to the ultimate limit. I know we have three films before this one, so to make sure that everybody's absolutely caught up with everything, in this video, we're going to explore the story so far, why John Wick is such a deadly force, what happens in John Wick 4, the ending, to the future of the John Wick series as a whole. As I said in the past, there are a few things in life that are certain, like our impending debts, the fact that we all have to pay taxes, and how pissing off John Wick is the fastest way to meet your maker. Baba Yaga. It was just a f***ing car, just a f***ing dog. You can either hand over your yeah. son, or you can die screaming alongside him! John Wick introduced us to the dark, sleek, and well-dressed underground criminal society filled with assassins, who for the most part seem to abide by a code of conduct. Uh. <laughs> Gentlemen, do I need to remind you that there will be no business conducted on the continental grounds? Each subsequent film uncovered more layers and the unique hierarchy and roles that governed his world, controlled by members of a secret organization known as the High Table, which we'll get into shortly. Gentlemen, this institution is now deconsecrated. High Table emissaries will be joining you presently to see the removal of your souls from the property. The remaining constant is that Jordani Jovanovic is a man in peak physical condition, possessing incredible strength, stamina, reflexes, durability, and agility for a man of his age, along with a ridiculously high pain tolerance that enables him to push on where most men would give up. Having trained in a school for assassins, along with the Marines, is an expert marksman with phenomenal proficiency for headshots, and a master martial artist that can use his body and improvised weapons to bring his foes down. He has ninja-like stealth, is a master technician, and an expert driver that can use his car as effectively as his gun. He even has great knowledge of the human anatomy and physiology, aiding in his ability to take people down as ruthlessly as possible, as well as help him take care of his own body when he's injured. I also believe that his affable demeanor, with his preference to avoid fights when he can, his friendly and professional manner, and his strong sense of honor went a long way for Wick, who is both feared and respected amongst his peers. John, you working? Afraid so. This enabled him to develop strong ties with a handful of people he closely trusted as friends, putting their relationships and lives in danger as the series has progressed. Target's work! You shouldn't be here. I was almost up. I still have five minutes. Please. Mr. Wick, they'll never believe I stopped on the hour. She did. They'll know. 
Know what? I told you where the medicine was. Where? Here, just below my floating rib. Be sure not to hit my leg. Oh, wait! One may not be enough. But what makes him stand out from everyone else, and what I believe to be his greatest asset, is his indomitable will and anger that go hand in hand with his pursuit for vengeance and retribution, in the kind of style that only Giga Chats like Keanu Reeves could deliver. In the John Wick comic series written by Greg Park and illustrated by Giovanni Valletti, we learn that John was an orphan born in Belarus who spent his youth thieving in the streets. Trained by the director, the head of the Rusca Roma that operated a school for assassins, Giordani was put through a strict training regimen that included a mixture of ballet and combat to ensure that recruits were not only good at killing, but also masters of movement. After leaving the Rusca Roma, Wick served in the United States Marine Corps. He then left the military and became a freelance hitman that was eventually introduced into the ways of the Continental by Sharon. The comic showed his first induction into the Maria crime family as their death dealer, paving the way for his transition from an amateur to a professional boogeyman. Within a few years, John began developing a reputation for his lethal efficiency, and he became highly respected and feared within the criminal underworld, with all the top bosses in the mafia and criminal organizations seeking his employment. At some point, he began working for Russian mobster Vigo Tarasov, who deeply valued Wick as an associate for his persistence, seeming invincibility, and unparalleled skill. Once killed three men in a bar. A pencil. A... I know, I've heard the With story, sir. Fucking pencil! After years of bloody service to the Tarasovs, Wick met a woman named Helen that he'd fallen in love with. He asked Vigo's permission to leave, and the gangster reluctantly agreed on the condition that he completed an impossible task killing all of his rivals in a single day. Impossible for most, but for John, it was Friday. Wick sought the help of Santino D'Antonio for manpower and equipment. In exchange, he made a blood oath by giving him a marker, an unbreakable vow to do any task Santino asked of him in the future. Upon completing the deed, John was finally freed from his service to Vigo, and the Baga Yaga retired from his life of crime. Following the death of his wife to illness, Wick stayed away from the world of organized crime, instead choosing to spend his days driving his prized car and caring for his dog Daisy, left to him by Helen. All of this would change when Yosef Tarasov assaulted John, not realizing who he was before killing his dog and stealing his car, the only two things left in the world that he loved. What follows is an inexorable siege against his former boss, with John wiping out Vigo, his son, along with their entire entourage of 77 trained killers. The sequel begins with John forming a truce with Vigo Tarasov's brother Abram, only to find Santino knocking at his door, requesting his services. No one gets out and comes back without repercussions. John Wick initially refuses, but with Santino blowing up his home and the fact that he gave him a marker, the indebted Wick reluctantly agrees to help Santino kill his sister, enabling him to take her seat at the high table. What brought you back, John? Your brother. Though he completes the task, John is betrayed by Santino, who opens a $7 million contract on John under the guise of avenging his sister, forcing the Baga Yaga to kill all 128 of his men. Loose ends. While Santino escapes to the safety of the Continental, Wick breaks one of the major rules of the high table by killing him within hotel grounds, taking his death toll to a whopping 205 people within a week. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm back. Unfortunately, things go from bad to worse. 
Wick is informed by his friend Winston, the manager of the New York Continental, that per the High Table rules, the contract on John had now been doubled as a consequence of his killing a High Table member. Winston then declares John excommunicado, which meant that he would be losing all access and privileges to the global network, in addition to having the full might of the High Table after his head. Tell them all, whoever comes, whoever it is, I'll kill them. The High Table is basically a council of 12 crime lords that govern the underworld's most powerful criminal organizations, many of whom we've already met. They are considered the ultimate global authority of the underworld, with many police forces, politicians and bureaucrats in their pocket, allowing them to conduct business with virtual impunity. There are 12 seats at the High Table. Camorra, Mafia, Drangheta, the Chinese, the Russian. Led by the Elder, below him and the 12 crime lords were their harbinger, an emissary and collective voice of all the High Table members, and the Adjudicator, the main agent and enforcer of the High Table seen in John Wick 3. Climb down off your high table and go f yourself. You gave John Wick seven bullets. Your penance will be paid with seven cuts. Long live the king. Then we have the Continental Hotels, the official operating grounds of organization members around the world, and the one-stop shop for rest, weaponry, bulletproof style, and any other form of support its members might need. Is this someone here yet? I have never known him not to be. Good afternoon, Mr. Wick. I'd like a tasting. I know of your past fondness for the German varietals, but I can wholeheartedly endorse the new breed of Austrians. Flared Magwell for easier reloads, and I know you'll appreciate the custom porting. Shall I have everything sent to your room? Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Seeking a way to remove the growing bounty on his head, John found the enigmatic elder, who gave him a way to remove the contract. To do this, John was forced to give up his ring finger and wedding ring, swear undying fealty to the high table, and told that he needed to finally kill Winston for aiding him. Neither the open contract nor the excommunicado will be lifted until you complete your task. I will, sir. I will be of service. After killing another 94 people in this film, he chooses not to kill Winston. Instead, he's shot by his friend in front of the adjudicator that had been hunting him, putting Winston and the New York Continental back in the good graces of the high table. Winston! Don't see any other way. How do you feel? You pissed John, are you? Yeah. Coming off the back of a whopping 299 kills across the one week that spans the first three films, giving Wick an average of 42.7 kills per day, the final film kicks things off with a bang. Aided by the Bowery King, John Wick 4 has Kratos, I mean the Boogeyman, continue his one-man war against a shadow organization that he'd once been a part of. A new day is dawning. No ideas, no rules. No management. In the sewers of New York, John is given a new bulletproof vest by the Bowery King, who was also taking care of the pit bull Wicked rescued from the pound. What I love about this film is that it incorporates multiple genres of action, beginning with a homage to traditional westerns. Returning to the Moroccan desert to confront the Elder, John shoots his bodyguards and bows down, requesting to get his ring and freedom back, telling him that the ring was gone like the Elder before him that nobody escaped their nature or the high table. The Elder explains that the only way John Wick would have freedom or peace now or ever would be through death. With the Elder finally saying that he came a long way for nothing, John stands up and says, not really, executing the head of the high table. You see, the Boogeyman is fed up with the organization and now wants to see them burn for not letting him return to his quiet life of peace. Partly furious and also a bit worried that Death Incarnate would come for them all, the High Table seek the help of an ambitious member, the Marquis Vincent de Grammont, who is given the power of Auto Imperator, essentially judge, jury, and executioner. Played with delightful menace and arrogance by Bill Skarsgård, the Marquis is essentially tasked with using the near infinite resources of the group to hunt and kill John while punishing those that helped him. In return, he would get a powerful position at the High Table and potentially a shot at becoming the new Elder. 
As a result, he sends their harbinger to the New York Continental to inform Winston and Chiron that the hotel was condemned, giving them an hour to evacuate the premises and appear before the Marquis. Clancy Brown brings gravitas and weight to the harbinger, and despite only being in a handful of scenes, he's the finality and conclusiveness of the high table personified. After being chastised by the Marquis for failing to kill John, Winston and Chiron are informed that they were also excommunicado. The pair are then horrified to see the hotel demolished before the Marquis callously executes Chiron, forcing the former manager to live as an outcast. I have to say that this moment was especially painful with the recent passing of the phenomenal Lance Reddick, who will sorely be missed. Knowing that John had already slaughtered hundreds of highly skilled men, the Marquis travels to his home in Paris and enlists the help of a blind retired master assassin named Kane, who also happened to be an old friend of John. I use the term enlist loosely, of course. You see, after being ordered by the high table not to see his daughter, Kane literally blinded himself, enabling him to be near her without breaking the rules. And despite the man saying that he was retired, the Marquis forces him to hunt John Wick, explaining that refusal would leave the high table no choice but to respond by taking his daughter's life. With the number of his enemies rising and his friends dwindling, John heads over to the Osaka Continental to seek refuge from his friend Shimizu Koji, whose drip is just as sharp as his katana. Hiroyuki Sonata delivers an admirable performance, with his Koji commanding the same respect and honor as Keanu's wick, and although he's only in the film for a short time, there is so much weight in the discussion he has with John, asking him if he ever gave any thought to how this would end. Koji emphasizes the motif of the high table as a group that only gives life, or more aptly, grants it in return for death, something that reverberates continuously throughout the film. The master also reminds Wick that friendship meant little when it's convenient, and he's true to his word, committing all of his employees and even his family to take on the high table's endless supply of killers that arrive at the Osaka Continental to investigate, believing it to be harboring John. In a bombastic set piece that most films would end on, the film provides us with an epic appetizer of martial arts choreographic frenzy and damn near unparalleled visual action. With most of the killers wearing bulletproof suits, the gun Fu incorporates this into the action, having them using it as a shield while also firing shots. The added difficulty of having them confront the fully armored men we saw in the previous films also creates this new level to the choreography, with headshots being used to merely incapacitate them temporarily until John or our other heroes got close enough to finish them off. Don't get me wrong, the movie is self-aware of how ridiculous many of the scenarios are, which often head into the realm of the hilariously absurd, but it's played so deadpan by the actors that it works. Despite John also getting involved in the carnage, the Marquis' second-in-command, Shidi, and their near-limitless number of fully armored killers wipe out most of Koji's men. With Hiroyuki at 62, Keanu at 58, and Donnie at 59 years of age, it's incredible these men are still moving with the fluidity and grace of guys half their age. After Wick exterminates waves of killers, he engages in his first battle with Kane, which is interrupted by a tracker named Mr. Nobody and his awesome dog, in a nice callback to the first film that kicked everything off. Played by Shamir Anderson, Mr. Nobody is hunting John, but decides to let him go multiple times until the contract money is increased to an amount of his liking. He even saves his life a number of times to ensure that nobody claimed the contract before him. While Wick offered to stay and help Koji, telling John not to waste a gift that he gave him, the injured master tells him to escape before confronting their old friend Kane, reminding him that brotherhood should come before contractual obligations. In the final bout between them, the injured Koji is no match for Kane, who is forced to kill his friend in front of his daughter Akira. Feeling guilty, and knowing that the injured woman would die if she confronted him now, he somberly encourages her to live and hunt him down when she was ready. The equal to John and Koji is of course brought to life by martial arts legend Donnie Yen, who gives Kane so much heart and humor, despite the precarious situation he's forced into. This point is definitely crucial to how the ending plays out, and although some of the scenes with him shooting people while dodging bullets as a blind man hit the realm of insanity, Yen moves with such elegant purpose that it simply works. Especially with the bumping soundtrack by Tyler Bates and Joel J. Richard, and Dan Lauston's innovative cinematography. The camera work is critical to keeping our eyes glued to the screen in the same way that the choreography is. In many ways, I think that John Wick helped save or at least preserve the action genre in its purest form. The problem is that while traditional martial arts movies of the 80s and 90s prided themselves on continuous shots to show how meticulous the choreography was, Hollywood came in with the multiple cut approach. While this made it easier for non-martial arts trained actors, and 
took away much of the legwork from coming up with intricate movement in camera work, the result is that the audience can't see anything. A bold strategy with no payoff but dizziness and limited satisfaction. As a love letter to the action greats and gun fu masterpieces like Hard Boiled, the John Wick series instead uses wide shots and continuous takes to show how the characters creatively use the environment in combat. So, not only do we have beautifully stylized action and performances from the actors and stuntmen that have poured months into getting the movement right, and not only does the camera enable us to see everything clearly, but the environment is a character in and of itself, something Jackie Chan, Donnie Yen, and the likes of Jet Li have tried to explain to Hollywood for decades. I never move my camera, always steady, wide angle. Let him see I jumping down, I do the flat, I do the fall. Showing his delight in playing cruel games, with the siege of the Osaka Continental failing, the Marquis stabs the hand of the tracker when he demanded more money in return for killing John. Giving him the option of either pulling the knife out or damaging his hand by pulling it away from the knife to show fealty through pain, Vincent de Gramont watches with joy as Mr. Nobody does the latter. While all of this is happening, the bounty on John continues to rise, hitting a staggering 20 million. The Marquis is so sure of himself that he doesn't realize his actions are quickly leading him towards consequences he may not like. Not only is Winston furious that he killed Sharon and destroyed his home, but nearly everybody he forces into his employment, including Kane, join him unwillingly, often putting them in a position where they choose to sneakily side with Wick. Returning to New York to meet with Winston at Sharon's grave, the Bagiaga is informed that according to the old ways, John could be free of his obligation to the high table forever by challenging the Auto Imperator to a duel. As per the high table tradition, John needs a second to support his motion, in this case Winston, but he also cannot request a duel with the Marquis without support of one of the 12 crime families, and so with John having cut ties to the Ruscaroma, he heads to Berlin requesting a new crest from his adoptive uncle Pewter. Of course, with the high table having begun to punish all those associated with John Wick, the reception is frosty. His adoptive sister Katia informs him that Pewter was executed by Killer Harkin, the head of the German crime family and his senior at the high table. Although they initially plan on turning him over to the high table, they agree to give him what he wanted in exchange for killing the man that executed Katia's father. In a flamboyant performance matched by the roundhouse kicks that only Scott Atkins can pull off in a fat suit, the actor brings the larger-than-life, asthma-puffing, kung-fu gangster to screen. Met by Kane and the tracker, who take a seat beside him inside the crime lord's nightclub, the four begin a poker game surrounded by killer's 50 or so armed henchmen to decide who lived and died. With the scoundrel cheating and setting his guards on Wick, the other two train killers assist him in wiping out Harkin's men in another slick action set piece. Wick is straight up headshotting and murdering bad guys in the nightclub while people continue to rave. Yeah, Berlin is wild and I'm Klaus. John is very much a man who mostly speaks through his actions and his actions speak for themselves. In fact, one of the best parts of the series is how the characters are revealed through action without the use of dialogue. Oh, ah! Having completed his side of the agreement, John gets a new Ruscaroma crest branded onto his hand, enabling Winston to hand letters to the Marquis, challenging him to a duel. Realizing that he might have bit off more than he can chew, the arrogant Marquis also reminds Winston that as John's second, if John were to fail, he too would be executed. 
Unfazed in leveraging the success of the duel to guarantee his reinstatement as a manager of the New York Continental and the rebuilding of the hotel at the high table's expense, Winston tells him that such is life in another sweet callback to his final discussion with his good friend Sharon. In a meeting that is moderated by the Harbinger, John and the Marquis arrange on the conditions of the duel, choosing to fight at sunrise using pistols. Showing he was just as much of a rule bender as everyone else, de Gramont nominates the reluctant Kane to take his place in the duel, putting John up against his equal, and honestly, probably once his superior prior to blinding himself. More than this, the Marquis does not intend on letting John climb the 202 steps of the Sacre Coeur that led to the location of the duel, and so the bastard doubles the contract, putting a bounty of 40 million on John's head, turning the streets of Paris into a war zone, with all nearby contract killers converging on his location. In his final words to the Bowery King, who gives him a new suit and weapons, and Winston, John tells them that if he died, he would like them to write loving husband on his tombstone, reminding us that not a day has gone by that he hasn't thought about Helen. Featuring insane chases, where John is literally headshotting people that bounced off cars, using fire-breathing shotguns, his hands, pistols, and his indomitable will, in addition to the amazing sweeping overhead shots reminiscent of Minority Report, the Paris sequences indicated that perhaps even death was scared of approaching Wick. Aided once again by Kane and Mr. Nobody and his dog, when John chooses to end the person about to kill the pooch instead of the tracker, John climbs all the stairs once again, after being knocked down from the top by Sheedy, in another over-the-top moment used to exemplify how overwhelming Wick's obstacles continue to be. With Kane and Wick killing all that stood in their way, and arriving exactly at sunrise, the rules of the duel are broken down. Both will fire a shot from 30 paces away, moving 10 paces closer each round until only one was left standing. While both graze each other with the first shot, John appears to severely maim his old friend in the second round. Remembering what Koji said about friendship meaning little when it's convenient, Wick ultimately tells Kane that those that clung to life died, while those that clung to death lived. He then intentionally doesn't fire a shot at 10 paces, enabling Kane to fire a crucial hit into Wick's stomach. Haughtily pronouncing his victory, the Marquis takes Kane's spot, telling him that his obligation was completed and that his family was free. But before he can fire a shot, Winston reminds him about the rules and consequences the Marquis had used to justify his actions, before revealing that John had yet to use his third bullet. And with that, John fires a shot to his head, killing the Auto Imperator and ending the Inquisition, while taking his kill tally to a whopping 439 bad guys. As promised, the Harbinger tells Wick that he's finally free of any obligation or debt to the High Table, and that they would honor their agreement with Winston. Apologizing for wounding his friend, Kane says goodbye before John asks Winston to take him home. After finally gaining the freedom and peace he'd long fought and killed to get, John thinks of his wife Helen and collapses on the steps. The final shot of the film is of the Bowery King, John's dog, and Winston standing over the grave of Helen and John Wick, which read loving wife and loving husband respectively, as per his last request, seemingly indicating that our hero had died. But the ambiguity in the King's next question and Winston's answer, in addition to the illusions and John's struggle to distance himself from the profession he wanted to retire from, suggests a dual meaning, which is supported by interviews with the producers, director Chad Stahelski, and even Keanu Reeves. When the Bowery King asks Winston if John was now in heaven or hell, Winston tells him he wasn't sure, prompting a huge chuckle from Fishburne and a puzzled look from Wick's dog. The creative team have all basically said that the character will rest for some time, and depending on the success of this film and how receptive viewers were, they would be interested in the fifth film. Let's not forget that their intention was to initially make John Wick 4 and 5 back to back, before that was halted by delays during the pandemic. The post credit scene with Akira approaching Kane and his daughter, and the fact that we don't see John Wick's dead body, leave it open for a sequel if Keanu, Chad, and the creative team feel as though there's more to explore in the character and world. But of course, Keanu is now in his late 50s, so if he ultimately decides chapter 4 is where the story ends, the film is the perfect conclusion for his character. It's kind of poetic that not even death could kill the ultimate top G. Only he decided when and how he would die. And when he did, it was done in the same way that he lived his life, by honoring his friends and loved ones, and exacting vengeance on soy boy aristocrats and evildoers. If we find out that John had faked his own death to avoid further trouble from the crime world in a sequel, his line about those clinging to death living would also have more resonant meaning. With that said, there are a few things on the horizon for the John Wick universe. Keanu is booked to appear in the upcoming spin-off Ballerina. Set between the third and fourth film, it follows an assassin named Rooney, hunting down her family's killers. Rooney was first featured in John Wick 3, seeing training under the tutelage of the director, the head of the Ruskaroma crime family. 
In addition to Keanu, the film will also feature Angelica Huston and Ian McShane, reprising their roles as a director and Winston. In addition to Lance Reddick as Sharon in his final appearance that was filmed before his death, it will also star newcomers Norman Reedus, Gabriel Byrne, and Catalina Sandino Moreno. An upcoming television series called The Continental, set in the 70s, will also explore how a young Winston, revealed in John McFaul to also be a member of the Rusk Roma, won control over the New York Hotel and safe haven for the high table. Colin Woodall plays a young Winston, Aya Maida Dagon will take on Sharon, Katie McGrath is playing the Adjudicator, Mel Gibson stars as a new character named Cormac, likely an assassin, while Peter Green will play Uncle Charlie, the cleaner we saw in John Wick 1 and 2. This is Wick. I'd like to make a dinner reservation for 12. With all of that said, I love this movie and think the creative team should be proud of what they've been able to achieve in this series so far. Hats off to Keanu, his tenacity, kind-hearted nature and professionalism as the tentpole of his character Wick, and the legacy of the career he's built for himself. It will be sad to see the John Wick series end here, but also bittersweet. The man has given his all to the action genre, and as one of the last action heroes, it was breathtaking to see him kick ass one more time. <laughs> That was a pretty good fight, huh? Yeah. I'll catch up to you, John. No, you won't. With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we explore John Wick Chapter 4. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Ha ha ha!